think we'll make a start. Um, everybody's been waiting, ready to go today, which is fantastic. Um, good afternoon. My name is Sally Burkery and I'm the Managing Director of CEW UK. I'm really delighted to welcome back Yasmin Kate Patterson this afternoon for the third episode in our series looking at well-being, stress, mental health and anxiety. With a career spanning 20 years in the beauty industry, Yasmin Cage is an expert developmental coach who specializes in mental health training, coaching and supports businesses on how to implement a wellbeing strategy. In 2013, there were 8.2 million cases of anxiety in the UK and anxiety affects twice as many women as it does men. Today's session is very timely as obviously it's the first day of the second lockdown in England and we will look at how anxiety presents itself both physically and behaviorally We'll also look at the causes of anxiety and to start and start to discover helpful strategies to reduce anxiety in our daily lives. Please do ask questions via the Q&A panel at the bottom and we will try to get to these at the end but for now I'd really like to hand you over to Yasmin Kate. Thank you so much Sally um, for the third and possibly final introduction. It's been an amazing partnership so far and I it's really interesting because Sally mentioned around anxiety and the number of cases around anxiety that we've got at the moment in the UK where they have peaked so high at over 19 million and when we first agreed this partnership which was back in September uh, we never would have known that this week would have been such a pivotal week for people with the announcement that came out on Sunday so I really believe that looking at anxiety now and what we've done over the last couple of weeks hopefully is the right pattern and build up that will support people particularly at this time and you know anxiety is one of those things actually that we could look at over a number of sessions um we're not going to so i'm going to see what i can do to fit into the time today to share with you as as much as i can but also some really key tips that can help you or help you help others if you feel they're struggling with anxiety interestingly in a recent article in the metro newspaper uh, Dr. Becky Spellman, who is a clinical psychiatrist, she was actually talking about the impact of a second wave of coronavirus and a potential second lockdown. And she said that this second wave is really going to affect people um, in terms of their mental health, which is probably no surprise to you at all. And she said that people who bounced back after their lives were severely disrupted and affected the first time round may actually find it more difficult to be resilient in this second wave. And that's because we threw so much at the first one to keep ourselves upbeat, to keep ourselves going, to find this new normal, as people talk about it, and work within that. Um, but again, we're hitting something that we've kind of done once before, but it's different. And do we have the energy to put back into it? Just last night, I was actually talking to a colleague of mine who works between Ireland and, and, in, and the US. And we were discussing an article by Tara Halle. And I'm actually gonna put a link to the article for you uh, in the Zoom webinar chat. It's a fascinating article. And it talks about some things that she terms as surge capacity. And this article basically says your surge capacity is deleted, which is why you feel lawful right now. I came across this article because I was listening to one of Brené Brown's podcasts and she refers to that. And it's just such a relevant topic right now. So the, the link is there if you want to have a further look at that at some stage. So if we look at anxiety um, to understand it better and how it can affect all of us, we know that people who are experiencing symptoms of anxiety can really begin to wonder if there's something wrong with them. Because anxiety has physical effects upon us as well as behavioral and cognitive effects. So if you are struggling with these feelings, actually you might feel quite alone. You know, if you have these large bouts of ongoing and persistent anxiety, but the reality is so many people struggle with anxiety. We've seen that from statistics that, that, that Sally has already shared. And anxiety can affect any person at any stage in their life, male or female. Uh, interestingly, we know that it affects more women than men. And that's quite possibly because women are more likely to talk to people about it. They're more likely to go to present themselves to their GP to ask for help. 
but that means it doesn't mean it doesn't affect men. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old, um, if you're an extrovert or an introvert, it can affect everybody. Now, anxiety manifests itself in many, many different ways. But it's also worth noting that medically, when they talk about anxiety, it's actually an umbrella term. So within anxiety, there are a group of anxiety disorders. Um, you have uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, which is the most common one, panic disorder, and phobias. So what we're going to look at today is more around the generalized anxiety. And some people can struggle with two or more within the anxiety disorders. Um, a number of years ago, I struggled very much with anxiety, and that was post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as general anxiety. They both present slightly differently, but running concurrently together, as they often do, can have a real impact on you. An anxiety disorder is actually usually diagnosed when a person cannot manage to function adequately whilst having anxiety in their day-to-day -day life. And this is when it presents itself over an extended period of time. But it's important to keep in mind that a certain level of anxiety is actually functional within our lives. It enables us to get up in the morning and get onto work on time. It enables us to cross the road safely because we have an awareness of what is happening around us. We can meet demands, um, you know, but at the long level, we as human beings are not designed to sit with high levels of anxiety for an extended period of time. Now, one thing I'd say to you is the first tip from what we've heard so far is that if you feel that you are suffering with anxiety, you are not alone. And just by knowing that, that sometimes can be helpful for people because there are others who may also be experiencing what you are experiencing. So if we look at understanding anxiety a bit more, you will have probably heard of Walter Bradford Cannon's theory of fight, flight and freeze, even if you didn't know who, who had written it. Now, Cannon's theory explains the physiological reaction that occurs in response to a perceived harmful event or attack or a survival, um, a threat to our survival. Now, feeling afraid is very much part of our, our human being genetic makeup. It's, it's part of our experience as a human being. And fear actually is an occurrence or a response to something that's either a real or anticipated danger. So it's part of our survival instinct. It's actually really, really important to us. It's an emotion that people don't like experiencing, but it's critical to our survival. I, I think of an example, if a ferocious animal jumped out at you, and I know we're not out and active as we were, but if a ferocious animal came towards you, it's this survival instinct, it's this fight, flight or fear theory that actually helps you to protect you because one of two things happens either the the body goes into flight and you run away for safety or all your body levels are pumped up so that you can respond to fight so it's either fight or flight in that particular example very much part of survival now the experience of anxiety is very very similar it comes from the same place the big difference is that anxiety occurs when the danger is not real so there isn't actually an animal there um, to illustrate this think about if somebody was to walk down an alleyway and it was a dark alleyway it wasn't particularly lit well you know the nights are coming in uh, much much earlier it's darker earlier now than it was three four weeks ago they might feel anxious they might feel anxious because they may perceive a potential danger or threat to themselves. Now, that doesn't actually mean there is a danger there. It doesn't mean that it's real if they walk down that particular alleyway. But it's a signal to the brain, a warning sign to be careful. And that person may believe they're in danger. So, as you can see, anxiety and fear come from the same place. It's warning, it's part of our survival. 
Now, when the fight or flight response in a human being is triggered, and it affects us in many ways. So it can affect us physically, as we talked about very briefly, cognitively and behaviourally. So if we look at the physical aspect of what happens to us, so not wanting to get too technical, but sometimes if you understand what's happening within the body and the biology behind it, actually there is a reassurance level in that because you realise that these feelings that you are experiencing are actually quite normal within this particular instance. So physically, as soon as a danger occurs, or we think there's a danger, the brain actually sends a message to our automatic nervous system to trigger that fight or flight response. Now, there are two branches here. There's the sympathetic branch and the parasympathetic branch. The sympathetic branch, that activates various different parts of our body to be ready for action, um, either to run away or to fight to save ourselves. And you experience physical changes from head to toe. You can feel it. You can feel it in the scalp because the hairs may stand up on end. You'll feel the difference in your body temperature potentially. All of these things are very, very physical um, effects of anxiety and, and the fight and flight experience. And that comes about because the sympathetic nervous system releases two chemicals. It releases adrenaline and noradrenaline. And these are basically the messages within the body from the brain that they are chemicals and they trigger our support responses when we feel that threat. And they are there for a certain period of time. They're not designed to be there continuously over an extended period of time. So these physical changes, as I said, you might feel the hair stand up and you feel like they're tingling on your scalp um, because the blood pumps around the body quite often. People who are struggling and suffering with anxiety may feel palpitations because the heart rate increases. So they may feel like that um, there is something wrong with them internally and physically because that heart will start to pound or it may be slightly irregular. They can really feel that change in the rate of the heart. That can then trigger sweating because if you think about it, when you are pumped up with adrenaline, you do have that sweatiness, that tingliness because it drives you and it pushes all your systems to the max. Because of that pumped up energy and how the blood is pumping, what the body does is it pulls it away from the extremities, it pulls it inside. So it pulls it where it needs it, it pulls it to the heart, to the lungs. So you might see sometimes with people when they are anxious, particularly anxious, the colour of their skin changes. Now, when women wear makeup, it's more difficult to see, but you can see it in hands because the blood will come away from the hands and the fingers. So they might look like their hands are cold or grey. Well, often in men, when they are struggling with a high amount of anxiety, they take an ashen or greying look to the face. That's one sign to spot. The other thing that can happen is that the eyes dilate. So people might struggle to see, you might see them blinking or, or doing that just to try and get their vision back in focus. They may see spots behind the eyes or slightly blurred vision. And this is all um, a chemical hormonal response to the flight or flight ex um, experience. So when you think about this, the final part is, um, as you can imagine, that with all of this happening, our muscles tense up, so people hold themselves really stiff in the shoulders, um, or they hunch their shoulders up, they might strain their neck, um, they might roll their shoulders because they might pull themselves in to feel a level of protection. And that in itself can actually um, trigger a lot of muscle strain and a lot of tiredness. So you might see that they are tired a lot. They might say they're feeling tired, that they've got this massive lack of energy. They feel drained. And this is a response to all these physical um, activities that are happening in the body when we, have, we are anxious. So that's the physical part. What happens with regards to our behaviour? Well, what quite often happens is when we say about fight or flight, so if we're trapped in a situation that's stressful and causing us a huge amount of anxiety, if we want to fight, or well, we quite often do that, you know, we can't do that with our colleagues or in a work situation, it's not possible. We might not even be able to flee. We might not be able to run away from the situation in that moment. So behaviourally, people develop um, sims or ticks. So they may rotate their foot, they may rub their fingers, 
they may fidget or they may get quite snappy or they might pace around a room and they cut they don't seem like they're concentrating and that actually links to the cognitive systems because as all of this is happening the body and the brain are on a constant state of high alert so as a result the brain is scanning for perceived threats and as well, as it does that it can't fully concentrate on what it's doing so people with anxiety quite often feel like they can't concentrate, they struggle to complete a task that they're doing, they leave it, they go away, they come back and then they can't get back into it. So something like last week when we shared the Pomodoro technique, that's a really good technique for somebody who does struggle with anxiety but is functioning with it to help them in a work scenario. So. All of these things we can see have a huge effect on us and there are a number of factors that cause it. So what causes anxiety? Well, there's biological factors and there's also psychological factors. Now, it has said in studies that somebody who has a family history of anxiety disorders, they are 20% more likely to present an anxiety disorder themselves. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that they will, it is a chance that it is there genetically. And then physiologically, um, this comes around lifestyle um, that somebody's had. For example, um, if a child learns and is taught to fear quite neutral situations when they are younger, it actually becomes more difficult for them in adulthood to extinguish and get rid of these learned patterns of behaviour. So therefore that can contribute into an anxiety disorder later in, in life. So we've seen that anxiety actually is a response to a threat, a perceived threat or a very, very real threat and it's their part of our survival. But if it's something that you feel is spiraling out of control, there are things that you can do to, to help yourself. And if you look back at last week's episode and if you've got the PDF for last week, there are tips in there around stress management that are also incredibly relevant for anxiety. And that's why we built the series of webinars in the way that we have. Now, with the current pandemic situation, you know, this is a very real situation for many, many people. Um, we are looking for more potential dangers of threat. So we are keeping our awareness out. We're scanning, you know, the first thing that people are talking about at the moment are second lockdown, uh, an election, um, many different things that are, are, are seen as perceived threats or very high level of concerns and anxiety for people. So when you start to notice these things happening and you notice there are anxious symptoms of anxiety, then we start to look for them more. And the more we look for them, the more anxiety it builds and it builds a vicious cycle within anxiety. Now, quite often two things happen within this vicious cycle. So we start to look for anxiety, we find anxiety. When we find anxiety, we look for more anxiety. And then as I say, one or two things happens. Either we move into avoidance of a situation or we initiate safety behaviors. So if we look at avoidance first of all, because this is something that a lot of people do, I know it's something that I have done in the past and it's a very natural human behavior to avoid a situation or take yourself away from a situation that you think may cause you harm or threat or anxiety. So that is a tactic to try and reduce anxiety levels is by avoiding what may cause you the anxiety. Now, in the short term, that works. However, in the longer term of continuously avoiding something that may cause you anxiety isn't actually going to help you. And it can make that anxiety worse in the long term because the more you avoid it, the more the anxiety builds around that particular thing. The second one I mentioned was safety behaviours. A lot of people use these um, either alongside avoidance or instead of avoidance. And safety behaviours can be relying on medication, um, a prescription or non, um, consumption of alcohol, uh, security of mobile phones these days. You know, people have them in their hands all the time. They're like a, a security blanket. They can't go to the bathroom without it. They can't eat without it. it it's there in, in their lives. Um, and we need to learn to put them down again and reconnect. 
or we may um, have an exit plan if we know we're going somewhere that is going to cause us anxiety. Uh, we may have a friend actually pre prepped to call us on our mobile phone um, to be able to then give us an excuse to take ourselves away. Um, and these safety behaviours actually play their part in that vicious cycle of anxiety because you become reliant upon the safety behaviour. And what happens is you don't learn the emotion that is causing you the anxiety. And therefore you don't realize that emotions tend to come down from their apex upon their own accord. And quite often you either try and suppress an emotion that you don't like or avoid it. But what that means is you don't learn to recognize that emotion and to be able to process it and deal with it and sit with it so that you can start to bring your anxiety levels down by recognizing it, sitting with it and naming it. So if we want to reverse that cycle of anxiety now, we know what it is, how do we do it? Well, you can turn it around and there are a number of different ways. So first of all is recognizing the feeling of anxiety, learning to sit with it as I've just said and recognize it know that that emotion, that feeling, it will pass. That how you were feeling half an hour ago isn't necessarily how you're feeling right now because things change and our emotions change, they come like waves. And it's also about one small step at a time and potentially actually confronting the thing that causes you the fear and the anxiety because as you do that, you become more confident with it. It's just like learning something new. The more you practice it, the more skilled you become, the easier it gets, the more confident you feel practicing it, the easier it gets, and it be becomes a positive cycle. Also, if you think back to last week, we talked about the stress container. If you remember, I had the two glasses, I had the pint glass and the shot glass, and I said the size of your stress container, the size of your vulnerability, is very much dependent on how you manage stress so go back have a look at that i know the episode is going to go up on youtube if you've missed it and there's a pdf in there that can be helpful for you and all of these things help you to reverse that cycle it takes practice like anything does uh, but you can do it the other thing is when a person suffers with anxiety quite often um, this is also triggered by a number of unhelpful thinking styles and if you look at anything on unhelpful thinking styles there's quite a number of them just for sort of matter of time today I'm not going to go through all of them obviously but I have done a pdf again this week um, around understanding anxiety and I know the CW team are going to send it to you afterwards and in there you will find all the unhelpful thinking styles and what they are and therefore you can review yourself and see if you recognize any of these unhelpful thinking styles within your own behaviors. Ones that always jump out for me are uh, mental filtering. And this is like a tunnel vision or putting a spotlight on something. And quite often when we do this, we focus on the negatives. We focus on what's not right. We focus on the, the threat or the fear rather than focusing on what is right and what is good and what is also available. Um, some people catastrophize, they blow everything out of all proportion. This is a, a really significant one within anxiety. Um, they uh, foresee or predict events in the most horrendous way possible. And then by doing that, they pull themselves away and they avoid situations. Remember we talked about that earlier on. Black and white thinking. Um, I know this is something that I have done myself in the past and I had to check myself on. So it's either right or wrong. Uh, it's either black or white. There are no shades of gray. There's no in between. And then for some people, I hear this so much. When I'm working with my coaching clients, I hear I should, I must, I have to. And it's called shoulding and musting, where people say, well, I should do that. I have to do that. And I must do that. Why? So in the PDF, there's actually a section around that that would be really, really helpful if that's one of your unhelpful thinking styles. So 
I want to share a couple more helpful strategies with you. So aside from the PDF, a few of them now. We are living in a pandemic. Things are weird. We have never within any of our generations that are alive on this planet right now been in a situation like we are in. It's unprecedented. First time we went into lockdown, we had no clue of how to deal with it. We're now on lockdown number two in the UK. We're a little bit more equipped than we were back at the beginning of April. So there is good news. We, we've, we've been here before, guys. We've done this before. We know what we're doing and we know that we can do it again because we have done it before. So what can we do? Well, we can set ourselves goals. Small, daily, achievable goals. If you are somebody who's gone back onto furlough as of today because of the lockdown and you're not office based, your routine will have been thrown out of the window. So you need to set yourself goals, small things that you achieve every single day. Put hobbies in there, put in there something that you will enjoy doing that you don't normally get the opportunity to do because life can be so busy and distracting. Reframe your thinking. Now this is in the PDF because this is really, really key. It's tough to do at first. It takes practice just like most things do that are good for our growth and our personal development. There is a section of that in the PDF. I'll let you have a little look at that when you get it through. Having a routine is important, particularly if you have children, you need to have purpose. As human beings, we need routine, we need structure, we need to know what we're doing because if we don't have routine, we're thrown into chaos. If we're thrown into chaos, we're thrown into fear. If we're thrown into fear, we're thrown into anxiety. So this is very, very important. The other thing is learning to say no. This is huge within anxiety because quite often when people struggle with anxiety, they feel they cannot say no. They feel that uh, part of their added value is by giving um, and subjugation for themselves and saying yes. So we have to learn to say no and feel good about it. I've written a section of that in the PDF with some tips for you because I think that's one that's good to go away and have a little look at afterwards and as you start to digest things and see how you can start to say no more in your life but still feel good inside. We've talked about on previous weeks how important exercise is. This makes no difference. Get up, get off the sofa, get out, get in the fresh air. Um, I actually read something this morning on LinkedIn that I was really impressed with. That one company have actually said to their employees that they have to all take a break between the hours of one and two and go for a walk in the daylight because it's getting dark early. They're saying you have to do that while the daylight is there at its strongest point between one and two. So you're getting the levels of vitamin D that you need in your system. And put something in your diary that actually, do you know what? You're going to enjoy every single day. You, you know, we have to do this. We have to put good things in our diary um, as well as other things that are mundane and every single day life. So I'm just conscious of time. So I think I'm going to have a little move and look to the question and answer section and see what has come up. Um, right. From what you've shared today, I actually thought I was stressed, but now I think it might be anxiety. What do I do? Right, so um, I'm, that question came in quite early. So I'm hoping that some of the tips that I've shared whilst the, the webinar's been going has given you some pointers towards that. There is more in the PDF. I have, like I did last week, I put more in there purposely for you to go away and for to digest afterwards. If you feel that your anxiety has reached a level that is unmanageable for you for a consistent period of time and it's continued for a number of weeks, ring your GP go and talk to them. Um, it, everything's over the phone now, but they will ring you back. And I've noticed that GPs are faster at getting back and sort of having conversations with you or with us now during lockdown rather than when they're seeing people um, actually face to face. So they are getting through people and queries. So there is help there. They can make referrals for you. Okay, what else have we got? That one's done. 
um, I think a friend of mine is struggling with anxiety, what can I do? Um, that's a really great question and actually a really, really lovely one that you're recognising it within uh, a friend because, you know, sometimes we don't always see these things within ourselves. We talked about this last week. And I, what I would say here is there are a number of resources. So, so just talk to them, pick up the phone, go and see them if they're within your bubble. Talk to that friend. We said this last week about talking with empathy and compassion and making time. Uh, we talked about taking 10 together in the very first session. So you're actually dedicating some time to that person. Not everybody wants to go to the doctor and talk to the GP. There are a number of different links that are available. Um, the NHS UK website actually has got some amazing resources on there, uh, either that you can share with your friend or even you can do yourself. There's a lot of help, self-help techniques in there that even if you talk to your doctor, they will refer you to do anyway. Anxiety UK is an amazing website if you're struggling with anxiety there's a load of free resources there and then there's also Mind. I have put some links actually in the back of the PDF uh, in addition because I thought people may want some level of signposting so I, I, have, I have done that today as well. Um, actually this comes in with one of the other questions that's come in it's and you know are there any books or specific online resources that you would recommend? Um, yes check the pdfs to um to to have a look in there there are loads of books you know even if you go to actually don't i'm not going to say that because they're probably shut now because they're not going to be classed in as essential service but if you went to someone like the works or look on amazon and type in understanding anxiety there are so many different things um the mental health half day awareness course focuses quite a lot a lot on anxiety that's quite helpful uh so there are links there if you do want more if you want to drop me a message on linkedin i'm more than happy to send you further links if you think that that would be helpful um right another question there's been loads of questions on anxiety today so i'm going to answer this one what can managers and organizations do to help people with anxiety and manage it I'm worried about the well-being of my staff, but I'm also worried about them going off sick and the impact on the business. Wow, that's a question I get asked a lot when I start to talk in organisations about mental health, because I think that a lot of people are concerned that if they put the spotlight um, onto an issue, that it's going to make the issue worse. Whereas actually having that openness and that awareness and talking around mental health can actually support and help people. But there's always that fear of if I see it and name it, will they go off sick? If they realise that uh, I recognise it, will I lose them from the business? What impact does that have on the rest of my team? Now, these are very real fears. Having the right wellbeing policy in place is, is critical. We've talked about this each week getting the training on a full 360 of the staff so there is a level of mental health awareness across the business so that it reduces stigma and it becomes more acceptable to talk about mental health, particularly stress and anxiety. They are the biggest ones that affect uh, a workplace organisation. Um, having mental health first aiders uh, in the business, not so that they are there to have a line of people at the door, but they then, if they come on a mental health first aid course, you get a massive manual of resources that can help you signpost people for many different things. The support there is, is huge and uh, fantastic. And that's, that's something that if you want to contact me for, and I know Sally and I will talk about the business resource section for CW, um, there will be things that I will be putting up available for people in there as well. Somebody's, this is going to be my last question now because I'm just uh, conscious of time and we've had some amazing questions. I really, really thank all of you for this. Do you have any useful tips on increasing resilience? Uh, yes, in the workbook of understanding anxiety, I have put more tips in there. Um, also, what I will ask the CW team to do for everybody that has been on the webinar today, I'm going to ask them to also send you the PDF from last week's session on stress because the two link really really well together and there's tips in that first one that will also be really really relevant for helping you understand anxiety uh, and actually have some solutions that may uh, help you so on that note I am going to pass back to 
Sally and the CEW team. Um, I, I a huge thank you to them for allowing me to uh, do this webinar with them in partnership. It's been fantastic. I think the timing of it has been quite critical, even though we wouldn't have expected it necessarily at the time. Uh, CEW do so much to help what I still class as our industry, my industry, it's the cosmetics industry. I've it's, it's all I've known um, and it, it's my passion and, and my love alongside mental health and, and well-being and how they support people in the business. I'm conscious of the impact that the second lockdown is going to have on our beauty advisors that are in store that are going to be furloughed again um, and have a different way of working. So if you have beauty advisors in your organisation that you need support with, talk to me, reach out. But I also want to thank CW for making webinars like this available to people outside our industry because it is so important that we can share these resources and support other people wherever they come from. Um, and it is a great network. So Sally, thank you. And I'm going to pass over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I feel like I've, I'm, it's a lot darker in the background since we last started this, this, this session about half an hour ago. Um, I'm so grateful to you for your expertise and the, the huge amount of time that you spent on this final session for CW and all three episodes. I, if you haven't seen them all, I'd encourage you to go and check them out online. Just give us a few days. Uh, we'll edit them and get them up. So probably um, end of this week, beginning of next. Um, honestly, it's such a challenging time for all of us, balancing work and life and facing all of the many challenges that 2020 has given us so far and obviously will continue to do so until the end of the year. Um, we've really enjoyed having you with us as part of the team, uh, Yasmin Kate, and we very much hope um, to welcome you again soon to CW.